But we're going to get started. Um, my talk today is cloudy with a chance of zero trust navigating security in the cloud native cosmos. So who am I? I am Robert Zerchia. It looks like Sriracha, but I am the director of technical and community marketing. Um, that's my new title. It's hard to remember. I'm a community leader. I um, run an open source community um, for SUSE. And I don't run it. I kind of maintain it. Um, there to support, I guess I should say it that way. I'm an open source community con contributor. I write code for open source. I love it. It's great. And I am a ramen connoisseur. So if you like ramen, you can see me afterwards. I can talk ramen all day. Um, just a little bit about who I am. So the question is, is, is my software safe, right? And with that, you can ask yourself, can my software be trusted? Because software in the open source world, right, comes from many places. Uh, I work for a Linux distribution company. We have Linux, we have Kubernetes, and things are not secure. Things happen. Um, recently, we had a exploit. Um, well, I'm not going to give it any uh, more, I guess, precedent needed to be, but it even affected us, and we had to come and fix it and fix it right away. So you don't know where all your software is coming from at times. Even malicious things can happen. So all systems have trust, but trust is not a property, but rather an assessment based on experience. It is a declaration made by an observer, not a property of the observer, right? And this came out of a CNCF to tag white paper that I thought was pretty spot on about that, right? But what does that actually kind of mean? Well, if we hear this old adage, if beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right, um, what about trust? I think I am pr a pretty hot dad, um, but my wife would disagree with me, and she would tell everybody that same thing. And so if we look at trust, is it trust b based because you believe it's trust, or is it trust because it's really not there or there, right? And it's kind of a, a very meta way of thinking about it, but you say that's beautiful and that's interpretive, but we can't do the same thing with trust because trust here has to be verified. The foundational tenets of zero trust model is that no actor, system, network, or service operator outside or within a secure perimeter is trusted. Now this is from the DOD and I think it's pretty spot on, um, but it reads like, if you ever were in the military, this reads exactly like any training manual I've ever had in the military. Um, but it's the tenets of it. You trust nothing until it's absolutely verified. So there's two things um, with zero trust that are certain. Assume always a breach and always verify. And I've used that word verify. And what we think of this, and this was a hard concept for me to get around as a developer, because I'm like, it's, it's no one's, it's secure, it's there, it's, you know, I, I tested it, you know, passed the scans, right? But assuming the breach and assuming and always having to verify is a mindset that one should have when it comes to any type of software development, right? Always secure, always assume that someone's already in your system and verify that they're not there and the malicious actors are not doing something. So, kind of, I don't, this one's not really religious, so this one right here is kind of a weird one, but it's the 10 commandments of zero trust in the cloud native world. So um, it's unfortunately kind of a, rolls into that religious thing a little bit, but sorry about that. Assume every image be includes vulnerabilities because they do. I work with a project called SLE based container images based on our SUSE Linux enterprise and vulnerabilities get in every day and we patch them every day, sometimes multiple times a day. Assume every service is vulnerable. This is, if you put something on the internet, someone's gonna find something. You're not that good, right? Even in the open source world, we're not even that good as a, as a collective whole. Someone's gonna find something and it's gonna expo exploit it. Assume the network is hostile and untrusted. If I have to say that, I mean, you guys, this is the internet nowadays. This is kind of how it works. Always authenticate, always uh, authenticate the request sender. But here's a couple of the, the what was it? Next three here, uh, always monitor and verify, right? And it's, it, it's kind of interesting because when I read this, it, it kind of hit home for me. <clears throat> Everything should be always monitor, always verify behavior. And behavior is the key word I want to talk about today, and I'll go into it in a little bit. 
with it. So you're gonna verify the service instance behavior, verify this uh, service request behavior, and verify the client behavior, because behavior is a pattern that you can tell, you can, you can learn from. If an application's doing something that you know it's supposed to do, it's acting the same way over and over and over, the moment it doesn't act that way, that's a trigger to say, hey, there might be something wrong. Um, unless, of course, it's like, you know, sign up time and it's like open enrollment for healthcare in America and then you're used to it because it only happens once a year, but it's a behavior that's long running. It goes out and it happens one month every 12. So we always want to identify, we always want to analyze, and we always want to control. And it comes down to behavior, right? Because we, you, we want to be able to uh, assess what that looks like. Everyone know who that is? Okay, I just want to make sure it's Taylor Swift in case you anyone here. But with Kubernetes, this is what it looks like, right? <clears throat> you have user, invisibility, device, network environments, application pipeline, all of these things you have are pulling you in many, many directions. If you have not seen this video, my daughter loves it. And I thought it was a befitting picture because all of these things pull you in multiple directions and they will take your time when you are trying to secure, run, and operate any type of platform. So I want to talk about New Vector, and New Vector is an open source, it's actually the first ever fully open source container security management platform, um, and we bought the company from SUSE a couple years ago. We still maintain it, we open source everything, and it is free to use. So there's no excuse not to use it, right? When you're like, I can't afford it, can't put it in there. It runs in my home lab because of that. And what it does is it helps to minimize your service attack, it does real-time enforcement. It provides continuous visibility and compliance. And I'll talk about that um, in a moment towards the end with the demo. And I got smart with my demos because I knew that there might be a failure just like my dongle and I recorded them prior. So I have prayer, prayer to talk. And it does a lot of the automation of security with that. And this all comes from a single pane of glass. Make sure I didn't miss any. So let's talk demo time. We have a ping attack, right? And what New Vector is really good at doing, it has three states that it, it, it can operate in. First is discover, right? It will discover um, particular behavior that's not been picked up on and learned. We have monitor, and monitor just kind of records everything, right? And it just lets things happen as is. So I usually run it in a monitor state after I deploy an application and I'm testing it, I'm playing with it, I'm going through doing regression. I will monitor it because I want to see, I want New Vector to know how the, app or the application should run. So in dev, I will put in a monitor mode and kind of learn from it. When I go to production, I usually run it in protect mode. Now, protect mode doesn't, it's not forgiving and I'll talk about that in a second, but it's a really good uh, way of when you're deploying your applications, you're deploying new applications from a vendor, you can run it in a separate environment that's, um, that New Vector can see, and you can monitor it. You can look at the, let New Vector learn that behavior. And I'm praying to everything holy that this is gonna work. So, did this on Rancher Desktop. This is the dashboard for New Vector, very uh, intuitive here. And what I'm doing is I have a application that's doing a ping, right? Nothing too exciting, it's just gonna do a ping. And we're gonna let it run. It'll stop after a moment, and then we'll check what New Vector's gonna do. And then we'll change the mode, and then we'll see what New Vector stops in that particular state. So, I can go down here, and I will open up and I'll switch it from discover to monitor mode. And now it's going to monitor that again. So we'll go back to the, the, the console. There it is. And we'll do it, we'll run it again. Now this is a simple application, all it does is a ping, right? But it's not a behavior I want. I don't want a, a container pinging anything. So we can go in here and it told me what, it, what was going on. It, it said, hey, I'm monitoring it, I'm seeing behavior that you've told me you don't wanna see, and I am now going to, to log and document. Now I go back in here, 
right? And we're gonna switch modes, and we're gonna go to protect mode. And I wanna be honest, a lot of people don't run protect mode because it is unforgiving, and it has sometimes unknown consequences. So in protect mode, did I lose my video? Yeah. In protect mode, it'll stop it, and it'll tell you that I, I shut this pod off because I didn't, it had behavior that I did not want to have. So <clears throat> with these three states, New Vector allows me to deploy an application, right? Because that's what I like to do. I can monitor it. I can discover all the, the behavior I want, and then I can narrow it down and filter it out and say no. With that single pane of glass, you can go in and you can say, I don't want this to have file or access or whatever you want to set it down to, and it will, let, it will tell the pod what it can and cannot do, right? Now, in protect mode, you think, I should start with protect and work my way out. Generally, it's the other way around. We go into a discover, a monitor mode, and then we see what the applications are doing. Because if you are an operator, do you know what your developers are doing? Because I want to be honest with you, when I was a developer, my operators had no idea what we were doing. And so it was, a, it was like a game of cat and mouse of, oh no, you broke my application because it works in dev that way. And so it flips back and forth. Next, I want to talk about emission control. And this feature, this functionality is similar to Kubewarden. I've talked a lot about Kubewarden before, um, and that's uh, uh, it's very similar to some functionality to OPA or OPA. Um, but this is emission control. And I relate to this because, well, as a developer, you don't want people doing particular things. So <clears throat> we have a small demo here with that. And in this demo, we're going to set up a particular rule. And in this rule, we're going to, I can't remember which one I put on this one. Uh, yes, environmental variables and secrets. I did one with CVEs. You can do this and set it up where you can't deploy something that doesn't match the particular rule, right? And so when I'm going in here, I'm saying, hey, if you have any labels, and then I also put one for Oh, um, environmental variables equal true. And if someone tries to deploy, or any system tries to deploy, this will block it and say, no, you can't do it. And with this feature here, and this is what I'm going through and I'm kind of de demonstrating with this, is you're able to say, hey, if you have environmental variables that are in plain text in a deployment, I don't want you to deploy that because that's not secure. I do not want those to be out there. I think that those should be in a, some type of secret management, and I'm going to stop it. Uvector also lets you to, um, to have the opportunity to filter out CVEs, right? And so when it knows that there's a CVE in a particular container, it will say no, and it will block that. And so when you see those types of things, you're able to do those types of things, you can filter those out. Sometimes you, have a, you think, well, I just won't let the developers do that. It's not the easy case at that point, right? Because a lot of times you don't know where your software is coming from. A lot of times you don't know um, where your developers are pulling things from. And sometimes you don't know where those packages are from. So you can filter it out based on that. But again, in protect mode, it will shut everything else down. So I kept this, search, this talk actually short today. Um, we're fully documented out there, and documentation will allow you to go through, and um, we have an explanation on most things in the documentation. Um, our latest version is 5.3.1, um, and docs are not updated to that, but it just got, it, I think it was released this, earlier this week, so the docs team's a little behind on that. You can go through, you can read how do vectors deployed, how easy it is. It's a Helm chart. If you have Rancher, there's a Rancher extension for it as well. You can hit that and it will deploy and install a uh, new vector for you, but you don't need Rancher. Um, as of recent, new vector now runs on ARM, so it's able to run on a Mac, uh, ARM Mac laptop, if those don't have as much problem as this Windows or Intel one, um, but it also can run on a Raspberry Pi. So my lab at home has new vector running on four Raspberry Pis. It's a little heavy, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but they're Raspberry 3Bs, 
So they're not like the latest and greatest amazing Raspberry Pis, but it does run and it does work and it does do what I needed to do for that. And if you want to check out the documentation, I put the QR code up. I can leave it up for a moment with that. And again, it's just a way to go through it. One of the things at SUSE that we do to give back to the community is, well, we want to teach people this, right? We want to, we want everyone to use our open source software. And to make it easier, we created a course. Um, one of my employees wrote this course up. Um, this is New Vector Basics, and it will get you started with New Vector. It will give you hands-on um, labs to set up, install, configure. Um, I don't know if she has the ping attack in there. Um, she does have other, you know, simulated attacks, but that's like a gray area. You don't want to give up, you know, how people can figure out how to do malicious things. I don't want to teach a script kitty. Um, but this was just recently released, and you can go in there. It's absolutely free. You can learn more about it. Now, with this course itself, um, the creators of New Vector are still with SUSE, and they did not like the level of content that we got. Um, so Divya is asking, adding extra courses on there and taking deeper scenarios. So this is basically what she's done in the next couple of weeks. New Vector Basics will be much deeper than any of our other courses on there. Now, Rancher, Rancher Academy also has other things you learn, Kubernetes, Kubeborn, um, uh, K3S, those, all those other projects that we have. We have free online tutorials for that. And you can take up the link. Kept this talk relatively short, but taking questions if anyone has any. You, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, there is a mic. I do not know how to turn it on, so you're on your own. I'm trying to figure that out. At the bottom? Did you figure it? Oh, he's coming. If you guys have ever seen my live show, you know I'm not good with mics. I get feedback all the time. You're not coming through the mic or the, the speakers. Okay, I'll repeat it so other people can hear it. So, um, you said the new vector uh, introduction has the ability to start the project. Correct. Yep, you can, but you have to tell, you have to be explicit about what particular CVEs. So we were playing, when we did, there was a few demos that we were recording. The Wi-Fi here wasn't stable for us, because for, I run off of AWS and I'm not plugging AWS, it's just where I run it. Um, it was just a little uh, thing, but you, if you have the CVE number, you can put it in there. It'll, it'll, if, you, if it matches, it'll say no, it will not let it deploy. So we were going through, we found a image, there it is. We found an image that, um, had that CVE in it, and we were testing that deploy, and it was blocking it because it wouldn't let you do it from through the emission control policy and saying, "No, I've seen this. I see this. I'm not letting you do. I'm not letting you deploy it." So in general, what happens? Is developers come and argue, saying that you know, hey, this is a CVE, but you know, here is my explanation why we are not impacted. Mm -hmm. Then you go and kind of triage it and reduce the severity level on things like that. So you. Typically, companies use uh, you know a vendor solution mm -hmm. uh, to kind of manage these uh, the severity of these CVEs. Can you hook up New Vector to uh, any such solutions? That I believe New Vector has a similar set of functionalities, but I don't want to speak on okay. behalf of what other vendors have done because I haven't done the comparison. But there is a there is a list where it says, hey, you know, it, it triages what it is, and you can set the triage level Tri up or down right. okay. based on that. So New Vector has that function. They have functionalities very similar if you do something along those lines. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Any other questions? Really? Okay. Well, again, thank you very much. Um, appreciate your time. And in case you're wondering, there's a link. I usually put this on a GitHub. For, uh, I will, I'll, I'll post it here. Um, 
of the link for the documentation that I cited in my white, this white paper I cited for this talk. And thank you. And whoever had the, the dongle, thank you. You saved my life. <laughs>